Well, hello there. I'm Adrian Warnock, and I'm joined here um, by Professor Peter Hillman. Now, P Peter Hillman should be well known to uh, most people in the blood cancer community, um, as he's probably the most influential, certainly one of the most influential um, CLL doctors, particularly in uh, the UK and also um, internationally as well. And Peter heads up the or runs the FLAIR trial, which many of us have heard of and some of us are on. It's something that's talked about a lot in some of the forums. So, uh, Peter, first of all, could you just um, greet us and tell us a little bit about where we are with the FLAIR trial? Because that, that should be a great place to start, perhaps. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Yeah, so the FLAIR trial has been uh, ongoing now since 2014. We started the, the first part of it, and we've now got just around 1,400 patients around the UK in FLAIR. Um, it's going very strongly until we ran into the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, so we were almost almost finished recruiting the trial, another 100 and so patients to, to go, although we are extending it to add in a group, another cohort of patients who've got 17 pediatrics and so risk patients, um, which will be interesting, I think. Uh, the COVID crisis, unfortunately, slow, has virtually stopped recruitment for a period of time, although, no, although it's now picking up as we come through the back of that. Um, I guess we expect the first results from FLAIR maybe next year. I mean, it's, it's dependent on, on the outcome and the, of the patients. And so we're waiting to, to, until we can report the first data. So we're doing a lot of work on it at the moment, preparing for that, um, getting all the, the, if you like, the ducks in, in a row so that when, when we get the results, mm -hmm. we, we've got it all sorted out. So. I mean, anecdotally, I guess I'm hearing that people are doing quite well on each of the different sorts of treatments, whether inside there or outside there. I mean, is it ever a worry that everything will just be so good that there won't be any difference found? Well, that's the, real, the challenge with CLL. I mean, it's a nice challenge to have, I guess, is that the, the therapies, even the control arms in, in trials are very effective. So, you know, we're looking at with FCR, um, you know, when we do trials, we, we, we're, we have to compare against a standard and the standard uh, for us at the now still but maybe it's disappearing hopefully is fcr for younger patients and of course one of the the good things about fcr is that the average time until the patient progresses is years and so so therefore to beat that you have to follow the patients for years on the new therapies um and so uh, we're almost a sort of victim of our own success in, in some respect although if our aim is to cure and to get away from chemo chemotherapy then you know, the, the trials like FLAIR have to be very large, which is why we have a large trial, and um, we have to follow them for a long time, which is what we're doing. What we're doing. Yeah, so one of the things I noticed in the recent um, uh, virtual posters that were released for the um, ASCO was, I think, two different epidemiological studies, and then I found a third one online just recently mm -hmm. um, that was published, I think, in the British Journal of Cancer, and they all suggest that... Um, for most blood cancers, and in particular, I think one, two of the three of those were just focused on CLL, that life expectancy is really going up in, in I guess, the decades that you've been working. Because, I mean, how long have you, sorry, don't want to highlight how old you are here, Peter, but you've been working in uh, this field for quite a while, haven't you? Is it true to say that people are living longer now? Yeah, the first trials I, I uh, led were in the mid-90s, so, so we've been um, sort of working hard since then. I, I think the last 10 years for CLL has been, a, has been dramatic changes. I mean, we had, um, when I started, I qualified for med, in medicine in the mid eighties, and, and then we had one or two treatments uh, for diseases like CLL, which were very ineffective really. And we've since then gone, gone through the era of Fedarabin and combinations, and, and if the, like getting the best out of chemotherapy, um, which mm. I guess FCR does, um, we can't really, Mac, you know, maximize it any more than that we tried uh, that was the first big step forward um, and then that was probably in the sort of 2000, uh, 2000 early 2000s probably and then really since 2010 on onwards we've had routine class and a series of new therapies coming through that really have a, had a major impact on outcome uh, for patients and, uh, and what you have to remember is that the the, the outcome that were, if you're thinking about a 10 year survival, you're, you're, there, you're therefore talking about therapies that were given 10 years ago, not the ones that we're using now. And so, so the, the looking at the outcomes of our patients now, it, you know, the survival is probably very close to the, to the normal population, I would say. You know, we, I can remember the, the era of going through tri ineffective trials where we 
you know, if someone had failed chemotherapy, the, out, the outcome is very poor. And, you know, by nature, we took many patients to transplant if they were fit for that. And now we rarely see the resistant patients in that way, and we take very few patients to transplant. That doesn't mean we don't need that therapy, and doesn't mean that, you know, in the future, we won't use intense treatments, but it shows you the change. Yeah, so, I mean, let's just back up for a second, because one of the things I'm trying to do with some of these interviews is make sure that people who don't know so much um, would understand. So, I mean, there's a few things about um, getting a blood cancer diagnosis, particularly if it's one of the uh, more chronic or slow growing or indolent, some people say, mm -hmm. um, like CLL, but also like some of the others, mm -hmm. um, is that people say to you, yeah, you've got blood cancer, you know, um, maybe you've got cancer in every drop of blood in your body, but we don't want to treat you and mm. for some people it can be like in my case it was 16 months um, mm. or something like that but in yeah. other cases it can be like 16 years or more yeah. before someone even needs treatment so why is that because i think that's something that people often find and i'm just thinking there might be somebody watching this right now who mm. who's just been told that and it's like whoa i want, I want yeah. to cut it out get it out of me yeah, yeah. no it's a very it's a very you know we're, we're sort of educated by through the media and through all, all, all we hear that if you if you have a cancer you, you, you catch it early, you treat it early, and the outcome is better. Um, and for many um, cancers, that is the case. But in the case of leukemia, and certainly CLL, that's, I mean, it's not, not the case. So we're seeing probably, um, nine, for our patients with CLL, 90% of the patients who, who, when they're diagnosed, is almost an incidental finding of blood count for preoperative or some other reason and they find a high lymphocyte count. So it isn't just that there's a delay to treatment, but half of those patients will never go on to need treatment. And so if you think about it, if we treat every patient as they, as they present, we're gonna be treating half the patients uh, and with all the side effects, even with the new therapies, there are gonna be side effects uh, that, mm. that uh, we're exposing patients to that will never need therapy. So, so that's the first thing I'd say. Um, the second, the second thing, I guess, is if you look at CLL, CLL is a disease rarely of, a, of, a, of our immune system getting a bit old and a bit tired, I'm afraid. And so, and we look at that, and we, CLL cells occur in a, in a high proportion, relatively high proportion of people generally. So when we look, we did a research study some years ago, um, over well, 20 years ago now, uh, looking at people with normal blood counts and, 6% of patients with normal blood count, oh, sorry, 6% of people with normal blood counts at the age of 60 have, a, have CLL cells. So CLL cells are a very common, um, uh, you know, phenomenon, but they rarely go on to lead to leukemia. So most of the patients we're picking up uh, are very early. Now, and the second, the final thing I'd say is that as we get more effective therapies, and we are getting more effective therapies, um, then they're more effective regardless of whether you treat people early or treat people later. And so you don't want people to be symptomatic and to suffer from the leukemia because we have effective ways of stopping that. But if people have no symptoms at all, they're, going, they're not going to gain by treating mm. patients early. And we have a number of studies that have, that have shown that. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because it almost feels like for some people there's a window that starts to open where maybe treatment might be needed might be sensible, especially if they're getting symptoms, but perhaps it's not so crucial. And, and then as time goes on, perhaps it becomes more crucial and it's like, you know, you, you, you might be more insistent that treatment is needed. Is, is that a fair way of putting it? I think, I'm not sure I'd quite put it in those ways. I, mean, I think what, what I'd say is that, 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 that a diagnosis of CLL, and uh, I mean, even uh, stage A CLL, early stage CLL that we find incidentally, is obviously uh, makes patients, people very anxious, and it's something you don't want. It's not, you know, it's not a good thing to have. Mm. And um, and so I'm not, I'm not underplaying the significance of a diagnosis of CLL to an individual because mm. you know, we all, we all have a fear of leukemia and things like that. So I think that's really important. You know, we've got work showing that people's quality of life is is poorer if they have a diagnosis such as CLL. Um, maybe just even the diagnosis is enough to to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that, uh, that, that the, over the years, when we had less effective therapies and more toxic therapies, there was a tendency to wait and wait because you didn't want to expose the patient to a toxic therapy, which could have some side effects and make the patient more ill to mm. get better. And so 
And then an FCR is a good example of that. We 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 tried not to give people FCR because we we knew it was you know quite an ordeal for the patient. Mm. And um, and then many patients over the years, you then treat eventually you treat them, and then they'd say, "I've never felt when they go in remission, they finished the treatment, they've not felt this well for four years." Well, that mm. implies that maybe they should have been treated a bit earlier because if they've now lived for three or four years with symptoms, which maybe they didn't need to have. And I suspect with the newer therapies as they come through, which we have less fear of, if you like, and uh, although we have to respect them, that there's a tendency to, for those patients who have symptoms mm. you know, to treat them when the symptoms are becoming um, significant to the patient. Um, yeah, uh, and I guess symptoms-wise, what would be the main things that you see in your practice uh, that people talk to you about? Well, lethargy, tiredness is the is the main the main symptom yeah. that the patient will talk about, and, that, and that's because that's a, a slow thing that, that you know if you start off with no symptoms, um, you don't suddenly become usually completely tired and you can't do anything. That generally builds up over months or, or even one or two years or longer, and so so that's an insidious thing that that uh, that and then. Patients tend to justify it and say, "Well, I'm getting older. I'm, you know, I'm going to be tired." Mm. Uh, well, you know, you don't get older that quickly usually, and so, so you know, CLR is often a component, and the sweats can be bad for some patients. It's they're rarer. I would say time this is more the lymph glands, the, the actual presence of the lymph glands don't mm. use cause a problem. But some patients are disturbed by having having skin yeah. glands, particularly if they're if they're very large. So, so they're the main and weight loss, I guess, is the other. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wondered about is, is sometimes the rate of that growth important? Because there are some people who go quite quick and some people go quite slow. And they talk about that certainly in terms of the, um, the problems with, with the bloods going up quite quickly, that that can be associated with symptoms. But I'm guessing if a lymph node is growing fast, maybe there's a risk it might compress things a bit more or get in the way a bit more. Yeah. Does, that, does that something you see or not really? Not very often, but it can be an issue. An issue. I mean, so I think that in terms of the of the dynamic of the disease, that's clearly the most the most important uh, thing mm. that will define whether a patient will need treatment in the, you know in the future. Um, you can't judge it over two different tests. So we you know we mm. always talk about blood counts to patients and the white cell count, and, and and many patients get very preoccupied by what the level of the lymph cell count is. Well, as a hematologist, you know, as I said, oh, Doctor, you, you, you watch it over, you're looking at trends over a number of results rather than a single one. For example, if you get an infection, just an unrelated infection, uh, it, the white cell can, can go up or can go down during the infection mm. just because of a response to the infection, then it'll settle down to its normal again. And so things can change the white cell count other than the disease. And likewise, lymph bands, they tend to grow slowly. So some, some patients, will have lymph glands that sit around and don't do anything for years and, and they'll very slowly increase and don't trouble them, in which case we wouldn't necessarily treat them. So I think the questions I tend to ask patients are, are you know, what's the impact the symptoms ha is having on you? So are they stopping you doing things? Are you not going on holiday? You're not going out mm. to bed earlier than you did before? Those sorts of symptoms that, you know, that, that are having an impact on the quality of life and, the, and mm. what people are doing then become, a, to me, more important. Yeah, and I guess that can be particularly perhaps an issue if you're younger and if you've still got a job. I mean, it, it's very strange for somebody like me at my age to have this disease because I go to the conferences and I feel like the youngest person there usually. I'm like the baby of the room. And now there are some people that are younger than me that have it. Um, mm. uh, you know, I've even seen some people in their 20s, but it's, it's often quite unusual. Mm. And yet, of course, you know, my father actually has a blood cancer. He doesn't mind me saying that. And for him, the fatigue that he experienced was less of a problem because he was already retired. Yeah. So, you know, he could adjust his lifespan a little bit. But for some people, you find yourself almost trapped um, with this dreadful fatigue that in some cases will stop you from working or if not stop you working, limit your work. Mm -hmm. um, and yet many people find that some doctors, even I hate to say it, some hematologists, um, Peter, will mm -hmm. actually say, no, it can't be your fatigue. You're not anemic. You can't, you can't be because of your cancer. It must be something else. And of course, we need to check for other things. Mm -hmm. But um, what would you say to people who've been told by doctors even that, that CLL doesn't cause fatigue unless you've got anemia? Well, that's not the case. And it's clearly not the case. And, and I, think, um, I think as a doctor generally, I mean, not just a hematologist, you have to be very, you have to listen to your patients. And, and uh, you know, the patients generally obviously know their bodies better than, than we know them. And uh, some people have, uh, some individuals, not, you know, have the capacity to 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 
to, you know, don't have the same, the symptoms have the same impact on those others do. And you know, I think you have to listen to patients. You have to exclude other causes. But the reality is, if you have, you know, CLL, you know, which is progressing, then then tiredness is a very common, it's probably the most common mm. symptom. And, and I think, um, you know, we most patients, you, you're not, you don't initiate therapy on the basis of a single thing. You know, it's not mm. the white one's going to pull the, or the plate has gone down. It's a picture of tiredness increasing, white scan going up, blood counts dropping, and mul multiple things usually. Um, mm. so if I had a patient, for example, who, this is not very common, there's a very stable CLL and then develops tiredness, but there's no change in the CLL at all, then I would be worried that it wasn't the CLL that's causing sure. it. Whereas if, yeah. If it's on the background of a white scan doubling every six months, or or you know some nose growing, then then that that almost certainly is the CLL. Mm, yeah. So then let's just come back where we were before a little bit. So we were we were talking a little bit about treatment, and um, it's it's just interesting to me um, hearing a little bit about the development of the treatment because from what I've read, and of course I'm not sure exactly where you came in, but you would have certainly seen some of this, I'm sure. Uh, initially, the very first drugs were given on their own. So I think fludarabine was like given on its own. Is that right? Yeah. Cyclophosphamide was given on its own. Chemotherapy drugs. Yeah. Then they, they were doing, given together, and and then somebody came along with the first kind of wonder drug, really, the beginning of all this exciting immunotherapy, rituximab, um, where suddenly you've got a drug that actually kills lymphocytes rather than just almost any cell. And then of course they thought maybe we should put all three together, and so. Mm -hmm. That that then became the gold standard in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that is that roughly speaking what happened? Have I got that roughly right? Yeah, I think that's a, re a reason. I think if you think of the biology of any disease like this, um, you know, the, the the a single there's very few um, leukemias, cancers that are effectively treated or cured by a single drug, um, because the leukemia cell in this case uh, is trying to find a way around the what we're doing to it, if you like, if you, mm. you want to sort of uh, uh, give it a, a, a sort of ability to, to think, yeah. but, but it's evolving around it, if you like. And so, yeah. and we see the same in infections and other things. So, you know, single agents, uh, the tumour will try and get, uh, become resistant. So the way you, you pin it down, if you like, is by hitting it in two or three different places so that that you, you close off this escape route, if you like, so you can't get, get away from mm. the therapies. Uh, and if you achieve a deeper remission, so the other side of that is that you therefore achieve a deeper remission, we use MRD as, our, as one of our mm. residual disease, uh, then there's less disease there to, to develop resistance. Um, so yeah. more, you've got that, the more, the more resistance is likely to be. So, and, I, and the other thing to remember is that um, the, the trials that we do are, there are several reasons that we do trials, um, and we being the whole, the whole sort of pharma and pharmaceutical industry and, and specialists, if you like. The first uh, trials we do are to find the right dose and make sure that the drug has some chance of working and is safe. So that's the yeah. that's a small number of patients that we do that, that study for, uh, and we do many of those phase one, phase two trials. The second trials are to get the to show a certain drug is effective and so mm. allow the drug company effectively to sell the drug to make it yeah. available and and that's usually one drug isn't it on its own well sometimes it's one drug on its own historically you have to try and isolate that drug so you have to show that that particular drug has a benefit so you can either have that drug versus another drug or you can have two drugs and add a third drug to it compared to the two drugs so you have to be able to show that that individual drug is actually having a benefit, either alone or in combination. Um, and then you have the big trials like FLIR, which, which mm -hmm. take drugs that are approved and then try to use them in the best way. So you mm -hmm. take the disease and say, okay, how, will you, how will, do we best combine, you know, Ibutin and Vinetrax or, or whatever drugs we're using to mm -hmm. achieve the, the, the disease? And they tend to be bigger trials and they tend to be collaborative group studies like the ones like the UK group because yeah. you know the, you might have two or three drug companies and they, who naturally would compete with each other and work yeah. they right we want to use both of your drugs together and so yeah. it comes to us so there's a lot of um, so that's the sort of natural history and I think 
I believe that we will cure, and we are probably curing a proportion of patients with CLL, and we've got to increase that that, that proportion. And I'm, mm. I'm stopping therapy and, and, and the disease not coming back. And if we're going to do that, we're going to do it by combining effective therapies in a logical way. So in a way, we're almost going back to the future, aren't we? And we're almost rebuilding, if you like, the new FCR by, with all these different building blocks and going, which, what combination is going to work? We, we know now that these drugs work on their own, yeah. um, but, but what will work? You know, will it be better to have drug A and drug B? Or, and, yeah. and to know about sequencing as well. And I guess that's part of the issue with Flair. I mean, I, I've obviously got personal investment in it because I'm a patient in Flair. And, yeah. you know, I look at it and now and I think, well, okay, so I've had, you know, what I've had. Um, will it actually make a difference if when I relapse at some point in the future, hopefully not for a long time, but when I do, that I then move on to a different drug. Will that sequence matter or will it, will it not actually matter in the long, long run? And I guess that's one of the questions you'd be able to answer in a, in a very long time because there's some good data that people do well after, you know, second treatments, certainly, maybe not fifth treatments, but second treatments. So, so I, think, I think what's changed as well is, is, is our understanding of disease generally. And so we now, understand, you know, when we started out, we didn't know the whole genome or what, you know, what anything about the, really the, not much about the the why leukemias and CLL in this, this case develop and what the the problem with the cells is and so I think FCR is probably fair to say FCR is the first combination where there was a logical reason why you'd combine the drugs that you know one that, that you they weren't just randomly put together they were they were designed to oh. okay, this the diabetes and hypothesis should work together for a variety of reasons one damages the, the DNA and the leukemia, and the other one stops it repairing it. So there's a logical combination. Um, and then we talked about add something else, which is a different way of working. And so that was FCR now with Ibrutinib and Benetoclax, those and the, fu the future drugs coming along, and our T's and all the other new therapies mm -hmm. that are coming, it, they're based on a deep understanding of the biology of the disease. And that allows you to then make much more logical combinations not only combinations of the drugs but the timing of the combinations so when's the best time to to do these combinations and, and, and alongside that we have better ways to assess response so so you know if we can measure one cell in a hundred thousand which we can now that 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 gives us a much more uh, robust way to assess the depth of remission in the patient and, and by combinations and so, yeah. so not, not only do we move forward by logical combinations we move forward by by being able to assess those combinations better. Right. Now, of course, right now, we have a group of patients who've still had or are still having chemo or had it in the last few years. Um, we've got a group of patients who are perhaps having venetoclax, um, maybe with rituximab or venetuzumab. Mm -hmm. And again, in a sense, it's the same philosophy that you just described to try and if you can wipe it out or get as close mm -hmm. to wiping out as possible. You talked about MRD negative, where mm -hmm. you're saying that the disease can't be really detected anymore. You mm -hmm. said you'd look at 100,000 cells and you couldn't see any, and you'd go, great. But then there's a very different sort of thing as well, because there's a whole group of patients on either a brutinib or a calibrutinib, and, and they don't usually get to this eradication, and yet they do very well. So could you just explain that a little bit? And how do you, how do you choose between that philosophy as you're, as you're a patient? I mean. You're sitting there, perhaps at your first choice, and maybe you're given the choice. I know it depends on the country mm -hmm. whether you get that choice and the yeah. indication and all the rest of it. But let's say you have got that choice. So if you're like, not so much between the drugs, but between the philosophy of wipe it out, or I guess maybe put it in reverse a bit and, and yeah. suppress it, but not wipe it out. What's your thinking on that? So, so I, think, I think you can look at it in um, the subway, you can answer that question. First of all, um, you know, we don't, many of the diseases we treat, we control rather than cure. So high mm. pressure, diabetes, or whatever, but other disease wants to do, and that's an effective strategy for many diseases. And and we know that you know understanding the biology of CLL, that that that, that the treatments like acalabutinib, ibutinib, those sorts of therapies switch off the growth of the cell, and that's an effective way of controlling the disease. Um, mm. um, if you, and it, and it um, isn't going to eradicate the disease, but it stops it growing, which is the critical part of those therapies. And and you know. The patients do go into remission because the cells aren't growing anymore. But if you stopped it, eventually the disease would come back. Now, um, that actually is a strategy we're now planning to, to look at in one of our trials. That you know, can we stop it and then restart it several years later? 
happen. So, so that's one strategy. And it may well be that, um, that you know, if you're, you mentioned age before, if you're sort of in your 70s or 80s and you, and you know, 10 or 15 years control of a disease might be very acceptable. And no, mm. and actually having relatively few side effects, not having to go to hospital very often, taking a tablet may be a, a very good approach for you or for anyone, not, not it's like age specific. Or so that so the, there's that side of things, and then maybe there are certain disease types of CLL that you know sort of markers within the CLL that say, okay, well this is a type of CLL we can cure. So therefore, mm. we will give chemotherapy, for example, um, because yeah. One type, or we can't cure this type. Therefore, why would we expose them to the risk of chemotherapy? Or of com and we're looking at that in combinations as well. So I think that has an impact. Um, and then, by and large, this is you know this may change. Um, the the therapies that that eradicate disease that get into deep remissions are more intense. Mm. Um, certainly with chemotherapy, they were, and with the combination of the and they're more intense, uh, and and so there's a price to pay, you know, mm. to get to deep remissions. And we don't know the honest answer is we don't know. There isn't a one approach that's right for everyone. Is the yeah. Right. So so we have to select it. And in trials, we will learn. Maybe in five, as you said, the problem is that with five or ten years' time, we're about to say, okay, well, this is a better approach. You know, treat someone aggressively, attend intensely rather than aggressively, get them to deep remission, stop therapy. And then see what happens in five, ten years' time. And then we actually, because the, the therapies are moving forward so quickly, we'll have much better therapies even then than we do. Mm. And so, so I think we have to make a decision. So the things that make that, that help, I mean, availability of therapy, obviously, but yeah. let's say we have the availability of a routine best class chemotherapy, is what does the patient want from the therapy? What's achievable for the patient? You know, if you've got very bad heart disease or other problems then you have to tailor what therapy can be given um mm. and um and that those sorts of things are important so it's a very much discussion with the patients i think uh mm. in that context yeah and so this is the thing isn't it that there's a lot of complexity in what you're describing and that's before we start involving things like infection risk which of course is very topical at the moment and yeah. many people um are also told unfortunately by some doctors that they're not really at infection risk. And yet, um, this is an immune disorder right from the beginning, as you explained. A, a tired mm -hmm. immune system, I think, was the words you used. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, it, it can be suddenly very shocking for someone um, if, for example, they suddenly get a pneumonia um, or something like that happens and they go, oh gosh, actually, or, or obviously with the recent news as well, you know, actually, I have got a problem. And so, there's a lot of complexity to the management of this condition that moved beyond even just which drug to choose and when to give it. and and all of that. So I guess my question to you is, um, how important do you think it is for, for patients to be seen by somebody who, who really is an expert in CLL, who sees a lot of CLL patients, if you like? Because I did notice that one of the papers suggested uh, that that might um, be associated with longer life if you saw somebody who saw more patients with CLL. Uh, that was one of the findings in one of the epidemiological studies. So I, I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, the, the thing I'll add is, is uncertainty. So we've had a massive change in the treatment to see that in the last 10 years. And because it's a, a slow disease and we see very good outcomes, there is uncertainty. Even the people who know all of the data and even the data that's not been published yet, uh, you know, mm. the trials are ongoing. You know, we do trials because there's uncertainty and we don't have the answers. And so even someone like myself or someone who knows the data very well, you know, we have to accept that, that we're, we're making a judgment call on the information we have and that may change, um, you know, as we get more and more data. Um, in terms of the specialists, I think, I think patients should take, to some extent, ownership of their own disease. And mm. so, so I think, uh, and I never have an issue with patients who are well informed because it's much easier for me to have a discussion with a patient um, that, it's also accepting that you know patients aren't doctors and not scientists necessarily, and they won't necessarily be able to analyze the data. So you have to have a relationship with your hematologist. Um, mm. Allows you to ask the questions and not feel that it's a stupid question or you know that you're being ignored. You know, in terms of your symptoms mm. or whatever. Uh, that's an important um, sort of element of the relationship. Um, 
I think most hematologists are experienced at treating CLL. I mean, whether, but, um, you know, there's a lot of information out there now, isn't there, on you know, mm. websites and, you know, uh, patient webinars and patient groups. And I think it's, it's a good thing to, to, you know, arm yourself with information, uh, but mm. not to the extent where you, you know, that, uh, that you're going to replace the hematologist. So no. I think trials are important. I mean, I'm a trialist, obviously, and, and I think mm. you see new therapies in trials. And so one of the questions you should be asking as a patient is, you know, is it a trial? And, you know, if there isn't a trial, is there one somewhere nearby that I should go to? Because generally the, the, the centers running trials are the ones who are, have a more sort of um, uh, scientific sort of involvement in, in, in the, the disease, which is important for some people. I mean, but traveling 200 miles to see a specialist is not for everybody. And no, so, for sure. I think it's a balance between, between that. Um, so, so, yeah. so you personally, um, in a year or in a month, let's say in a month, it might be a bit easier. How, how many people do you think you see with, with CLL? Roughly? We, we, yeah, so we have a big team in Leeds. So, um, you know, we run a lot of clinical trials in CLL. That's one of our biggest mm. areas. Um, so we do clinics. Uh, we see, and we see, of course, we see some patients several times. So, you know, if you're yeah. starting treatment, you're going to be seen every week with an FFAX, for example. Uh, but we, we see in my unit probably 150 to 100 patients a week with CLL or related diseases. So, you know, one yeah. of the diseases at that time. Um, and so those, they're often yeah. repeated sort of patients. New patients, as in new to us or, or referred in to us, you know, you know, two or three a week probably we see with mm. maybe more if you stage A patients with the whole team. Yeah. So I guess that's an awful lot of people to sort of start to recognise patterns and start to learn a bit from the experience. And I guess that's a part of being a doctor that some people who aren't doctors don't perhaps understand, that actually the more you see of a particular condition, the more skilled you're going to get. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit like if you were having a car fix, would you want to have a mechanic <laughs> doing the task who was doing it for the first time or who maybe only saw five of that in a year versus yeah. somebody who sees 50 a month? You know? I think I have to say that the practice in the UK is, um, is based, it's haematologists looking after leukaemia, or leukaemia yeah. uh, which is different to some other countries around the world. And so, and actually, even in my time as a haematologist, um, even haematologists have become subspecialized. So, so the, we now have haematologists who just look after leukemias or just look, look after lymphomas, really. Um, mm. uh, in many, even in, even in big district general hospitals, there'll be a subspecialization within haematologists. So most, most for a disease like CLL, um, most haematologists have a lot of experience of managing CLL. Um, and there are, um, there's a, there are obviously professional fora that, that you know, involving mm. myself or several of us in the UK. And, um, and I think I get a lot of um, emails and, and letters from other haematologists mm. asking for advice over certain patients, particularly if, there's a, if something is slightly out of the, out of the audience, like a very young patient or a patient with mm. some mm. and So we get a lot of, of informal referrals of that type that we would maybe advise from a distance. And if we mm. had a trial, I might say, for example, say someone from the South Coast contacted me and said, we've got this patient. I might say to them, well, well actually, we have a trial open for that. And I think it's open in these sites near you. Yeah. I did that recently yeah. with a patient downtown. And yeah. so, so it's, it's about, you don't have to necessarily see the patient to have an influence on the, on the decisions that are made. So I guess then if someone um, is, is going to a local hematologist, they're happy with them, and they happen to know, I mean, they could even ask, I suppose, you know, who do you work with? And what happens if I was needing treatment? Would I be able to get access to a trial? And if they would then say, well, actually, yeah, I'm good friends with, you know, um, the guys in Leeds or the guys in London or wherever. Um, and actually, yes, we're part of some sort of informal network or, or maybe even a formal. I've heard of some more local haematologists who actually join up with an MDT um, a, a, a multidisciplinary team at a more specialist site remotely and so those kinds of things happen as well and I guess that would give you a bit of more confidence and, and, and encouragement that that even if you don't necessarily see the top person that there is access to that expertise for your care is that is that yeah. am I summarizing I think, that well? I think that's fair I think, I think what I'd say is that there are there are various key parts to a, to a patient's journey and mm. 
the first part is understanding the disease as much as you want to understand it as a patient. Um, so, you know, I often drop, as patients have seen me, I drop pictures of CLL and they try and explain it in a way that people can understand. And I think it's really important that, uh, that you know, that you understand the disease, that you, that, that if you want to understand the disease, and, and you have a relationship with your hematologist that allows you to, to ask questions, as I said. And that includes a wider clinical nurse specialist that we have, a, you know, we and trial nurses in our, in our units that, that, that are very, you know, very important in, in terms of supporting our patients because, you know, it's not easy to pick, to pick up the phone and ask Pete Hillman, you know, about COVID if, you, if you've not only seen me once, whereas the nurse specialist on the end will, will feed it back. So, so it's a team, it's very much a team approach. So I think that's the first thing is understanding. And then the second uh, key aspect of, you know, when treatment's being considered, you then need to ask the questions, you know, is it the right treatment? You know, is, am I, am I, is there a trial that could, I could go into? You know, is there someone, is there an opinion that you might get that may not take over your care, but actually would give you reassurance that you're getting the right treatment, especially in a time when treatments are evolving so rapidly um, that, you know, you really want to, to, to get the right, right therapy. Now, some patients will be happy because they have a good relationship with the hematologist, that's fine. Uh, but I think you just have to be comfortable with the decisions that are being made. Hmm. That's really, really helpful, uh, Peter. And uh, I, I thought it might be good to split this into sort of two bits. Then this bit would probably be the longer bit and the second bit would be the shorter bit. So I think I might just pause it here for a moment.